Hi, welcome to our presentation. We hope you find it informative and thought provoking. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the EATA for allowing me to uh, speak on a topic that I'm very passionate about. I'm very fortunate to be joined by Dr. Justin Fleming, who's a foot and ankle surgeon with University Orthopedics, who's going to help me with this topic. I have no disclosures. One of my goals for this presentation is to challenge you to think outside the box a little bit in terms of your management of ankle sprains and think of some of the associated uh, injuries that may be creating some of the functional disability that some of your athletes are expressing with their ankle sprains. And keep in mind that ankle injury rarely happens with just a single mechanism of injury. And therefore there could be multiple structures that are implicated in functional disability. Objectives of this talk, we want to re review multi-ligament injury to the ankle, also discuss the relevant ankle anatomy, adapt treatment options based on symptoms, and discuss the conservative and surgical options for ankle sprains. In the United States, there's over 28,000 ankle sprains are reported each day, with, and it's considered the most common injury in sports with 45% of all athletic injuries occurring to the ankle. Most involved the lateral ligaments with a mechanism of inversion. And the only consistent risk factor that's been identified is a prior history of ankle sprain. The NATA released a uh, position statement, was published in the Journal of Athletic Training in 2013. And it, it was published to provide practitioners with guidelines and criteria to deliver the best healthcare possible for managing ankle sprains. It contains 37 different recommendations with strength of recommendation taxonomy, where each recommendation is given a grade of A, B, or C based on the strength of the associated literature. A recent article was published in the Journal of Athletic Training by Corbett, and they surveyed athletic trainers and found that there's only a moderate understanding of ankle epidemiology, with almost 40% of athletic trainers are unaware or unsure of the NATA position statement. The authors felt this was an alarmingly high percentage, and in their conclusion, they felt that a lack of understanding can impact how uh, care is uh, delivered. There are, <clears throat> excuse me, there are less than optimal outcomes, which oftentimes occur with ankle sprains with high recurrence rate, prolonged symptoms, diminished quality of life, reduced physical activity and a propensity towards chronic ankle instability. There's an association with, with heterotopic ossification and an increased risk for ankle osteoarthritis. There's also um, other lesions that can occur with ankle instability, including injuries to the osteochondral soft tissue, uh, tendons, and osteoarthritis of the ankle. In a review done by Conradson, they found that 37 to 74% of individuals with a previous history of sprain, had residual symptoms, chronic ankle instability, and perceived instability. Choi um, reviewed patients who had undergone successful ligament reconstruction and found that 13 to 35% of those patients still had pain after a successful ligament surgery. Leads me to believe that there could be other things contributing to the problem. So the ankle is the most important a uh, congruent joint in the body. It's got a large weight-bearing surface and the tibia and fibula act like a wrench gripping a nut. For those of you that have used a crescent wrench, understand that the tension, if the tension adjuster isn't tight to grip the nut, then the wrench is not able to function appropriately. Same thing for the ankle. If the syndesmosis is disrupted, it's not going to be able to grip the talus and function appropriately. Ramsey and Hamilton did a landmark paper in 1976 where they noted that a one millimeter increase of widening of the syndesmosis changes the contact area by 42%. The syndesmosis plays a pretty significant role. Choi also um, did a paper looking at uh, individuals who were undergoing lateral, lateral ligament reconstruction, and they did an uh, arthroscopy prior to the procedure, and they found that 97% had intraarticular lesions and syndesmotic widening was the strongest risk indicator for patients' lack of satisfaction following the surgery. Syndesmotic injury can occur to athletes who endure chronic inversion injuries and axial loading. Traditionally, high ankle sprains are thought to occur in one to 20% of ankle sprains. However, in sports, 
40 to 70% of all ankle sprains can demonstrate syndesmotic involvement. A good illustration of this is with a cadaver with the ligaments uh, resected and the tendons uh, removed. With an axial load and increased motion, the talus can act as a fulcrum against the fibula to irritate the distal anterior uh, tib fib ligament. Increased laxity, load, shearing on the lateral talus, and it acts as a fulcrum to injure the anterior inferior tib fib ligament. So there's been a lot of research done on ankle injuries and a lot of literature has been published on chronic ankle instability by a number of very intelligent, highly successful uh, individuals, some of which are members of the EATA. A lot of it's been published in the Journal of Athletic Training, but few studies accurately identify the injured structures um, with associated imaging. So you don't see documentation of specific injuries utilizing MRI, which has been shown to be pretty effective at identifying um, structures within injured ankles. If I can stand on my soapbox for just a second, I think it's high time that if we're going to talk about a specific ankle injury, we need to make sure that what we're talking about is really what we're talking about. So identify uh, ankle injuries with appropriate imaging. In order to be a proficient at managing ankle sprains, you need to have a thorough knowledge of anatomy and biomechanics. And the ankle is classically considered a, a synovial hinge joint, and it's really multiple joints, and it's not just one. But we have the distal tib fib joint, the talocrural joint, and the subtalar joint. And all these joints need to be considered uh, together when we look at the picture of an, of an ankle sprain or ankle injury. Ankle motion primarily occurs within the sagittal plane. And the ankle is most stable when it's in the dorsiflexion or closed pack position where bony stability provides the support for the ankle. The syndesmosis is stretched throughout uh, the entire range of motion, but mainly uh, stressed at the extreme ranges of dorsi and plantar flexion. Keep in mind the fibula migrates distally, posteriorly, and externally rotates to hug the lateral talus with plantar flexion and moves in a reverse direction with dorsiflexion. Looking at the lateral ligaments, anterior talofib fib and the calcaneal fib, what you should note is that the calcaneal fibular ligament crosses the subtalar joint. And not only does it stable the lateral ankle, stabilize the lateral ankle, but it also helps to stabilize the subtalar joint. So when the calcaneal fibular ligament is implicated in ankle injury, it can have uh, some significant impact on not only the talocrural joint, but also the subtalar joint. Also keep in mind that these ligaments, lateral ligaments work synergistically so that as the anterior talofib becomes taut with plantar flexion and slack with dorsiflexion, the uh, calcaneal fibular works in the opposite direction. I apologize for the fuzziness of that, uh, that video. When you section the calcaneal fibular ligament, you'll notice a little bit of a lateral translation and increased motion that occurs to the subtalar joint. With some of the soft tissue resected, you can see the lateral shoulder and how the lateral shoulder of the talus may be injured as it has increased tilt and, in and increased external rotation with the injury of the subtalar joint and increased lateral laxity. On the medial side, we have the deltoid ligament, both superficial and deep layers, stabilizes the medial ankle and helps to restrict uh, motion of the talus. An interesting study done by Takeo, where they put uh, force transducers within the ligaments and then moved the ankle through various ranges of motion. And they noted that tension was increased in those specific ligaments with various foot positions. And I think this is important to keep in mind when you're evaluating or analyzing medial ankle injury. The interosseous membrane travels between the tibia and the fibula. It's a thick tissue. Consider it much like the sail on a ship. As the wind hits the sail, it tensions or gets tight. Same thing happens uh, within the lower leg in that as you're bearing weight going through dorsi and plantar flexion, as the fibula moves, it tensions the interosseous membrane. And it helps to, uh, the interosseous membrane helps transfer compressive forces from the talocrural joint to tensile forces where it can be dissipated up through the, uh, the lower leg. 
Syndesmosis has got four main ligaments. On the anterior part, we have the anterior inferior tib fib ligament, posteriorly posterior inferior tib fib, and the transverse ligament. And then the incisorea, within the incisorea at the termination of the interosseous membrane is the interosseous ligament. Now the incisorea is, the tibia is concave and the fibula is convex. There are uh, vessels and nerves which come down into this recession and it's also filled with some cobweb-like uh, ligamentous attachment within this joint. All these ligaments together help to provide a ring of stabilization to stabilize the distal tib fib joint. Disruption of any of these ligaments is going to impact the stabilization of the syndesmotic joint. When we Looking at the syndesmosis, you can see that it's a pretty stable joint. I'm pulling on that joint pretty hard and you get minimal gapping, but not much. With resection of the ligaments, you can see it's still stabilized. So even though I cut the anterior, posterior and the interosseous membrane, it's still stable, meaning the interosseous ligament plays a key role. The other thing I'd like for you to note is that there is bony stability between these two provided by the anterior and the posterior tubercles of the tibia. So the talus is a, is a large weight-bearing bone. It's wider anteriorly than it is posteriorly, and it's 60% of it is covered in articular cartilage. The articular cartilage is less thick than the cartilage that's found at the knee. Therefore, it's less elastic and more prone to chondral lesions. Within the uh, insuria, uh, the insuria connects the, the talocrural joint and the syndesmosis joint. With a, with a small recess. But with syndesmotic injury, this recess height can increase with, uh, with injury. It's lined with single cell synovium. And as you can see from here, uh, there's like a meniscus-like or a fat pad or meniscoid-like lesion that helps to pad the lateral shoulder of the, of the talus and also help to cushion this joint you know, for the distal uh, tib fib joint. As you can see, it's a couple millimeters thick as it goes up within the joint and then the synovial tissue goes up within the, uh, within inside the insuria. In 2001, we published a paper in the journal of, uh, in the American Journal of Sports Medicine, where we studied 60 collegiate um, athletes with high ankle sprain. And we noted that there was a variation in height of tenderness. We looked at a tenderness length where we measured from the tip of the distal fibula approximately up to the most proximal site of pain, and we did a measurement in centimeters. And over the course of the study, we found that we were able to predict disability by utilizing this formula with relatively good accuracy. Um, and we were able to predict disability based off of a tenderness length. Ten measurement of a tenderness length is also important because it helps to identify a key landmark, which is the interosseous ligament, which is found at about five centimeters for average size women to six centimeters for men. Hofnagels did a bio biomechanical comparison between the interosseous uh, ligament and the anterior uh, tib fib ligament and found the interosseous ligament was stronger and had a greater failure load than the uh, anterior tib fib ligament. The insuria is joined distally and posteriorly by the fibers of the posterior inferior tib fib ligament. And this is where the interosseous ligament is, where the interosseous membrane comes down and terminates. It branches into an anterior posterior part of the capsule, but there's really a thickening. You find a thickening here of this ligament. Here's articular cartilage, which you can see within, within the joint. And looking uh, and another uh, specimen, this is the interosseous ligament. And again, this bone is pulled apart, but it gives you a good illustration of the cobweb-like structures that you can find within the, the syndesmosis. Also note this recess. And here's a measurement at the six centimeters is right at the termination of the interosseous membrane and the key finding of the interosseous ligament. Keep in mind that the syndesmosis is encapsulated. So it's got a capsule that goes around this joint and this capsule connects with the talocrural joint. This is important to note because uh, an image modality like an arthrogram 
may be beneficial for determining whether or not there's significant disability or significant syndesmotic injury. Turning our focus to traditional high ankle sprains, traditional high ankle sprains occur above the talocrural talo joint, traditionally rotational in nature. Oftentimes, they involve contact with another athlete, and the chief complaint is their inability to push off or cut to that affected side. They involve more treatments and disability time versus lateral sprains, and they can have lasting long-term implications. Looking at the evaluating the high ankle sprain clinically, one of the most important um, clinical tools that you have is palpation. And it's important to palpate for tenderness. Alonzo um, found that it was the most frequently positive test, but it depends on the evaluator's ability to find the ligament. It's important for you to know the anatomy and know where the, where the ligaments are. It, there's a highly significant, Calder found that there's a highly significant relationship between uh, palpation and MRI findings uh, of the ankle. Additionally, uh, when you consider swelling that uh, you may see of the ankles, uh, it may indicate structures that are involved, but the amount of swelling doesn't always correlate with self-reported function after an acute sprain. So this ankle sprain looks really bad, yet this kid at three days walked into my athletic training room with a minimal limp. Point tenderness over an injured ligament is a good indicator of injured structures, but also keep in mind that high ankle sprains may have minimal swelling. Another good clinical tool, um, which I utilize and I um, recommend you consider using is a single leg uh, hop test. Taylor first noted in his early literature of athletes with syndesmotic sprains had an inability to raise up on their toes and push off. And think, thinking about that a, a little further, it makes a great sideline test. Now, I think it's a progressional assessment in that we don't ask an athlete who just sprained their ankle uh, to say, can you hop on one leg? But we'll ask them to do, can you raise up, do a heel raise on two legs? Can you do it on one leg? Can you do a double leg hop? Then can you do a single leg hop? Make sure they do it from their toes and that the heel doesn't touch the ground. You'll find many people, many athletes are able to do a flat foot hop but they can't do that hop up on their toes. Um, Whittle noted that the greatest fibular loading occurs right at heel rise, where the axial load exceeds, the, um, exceeds body weight. So raising up in your toes causes hind foot inversion and it stresses the syndesmosis. Therefore, I think the single leg hop test is a very, um, very good uh, clinical exam and sideline test that you can use to quickly identify these athletes. Again, when the ring's disrupted, you have functional disability. Other special tests include uh, the Klieger test, which involves dorsiflexion external rotation. It, uh, when it's present, it doesn't measure instability, but it can be indicative of injury or irritation. Squeeze test is uh, probably one of the most popular uh, tests cited in the literature, um, where you compress uh, the tibia and the fibula at mid-calf, and you look for separation down at the at the distal joint. It's the least positive test, but when it is positive, it's got a uh, significant implication um, for the athlete. Test correlates with a longer return, and Calder found that with a positive squeeze test, there's nine and a half times the increased likelihood that that athlete's going to need surgical stabilization. I think the squeeze test is also good uh, to rule out fibular fracture. And with any rotational injury, we need to be cognizant for the possibility of a proximal fracture or a masonu fracture of the fibula. Other tests that may be utilized are the cotton test, fibular translation test, and the tape test are, are frequently used, but don't oftentimes have good performance on evaluations. Amy Swan did a nice paper in 2013, published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, where she reviewed 114 papers and eight clinical tests um, for, for syndesmotic injury. And she found that the dorsiflexion external rotation test or the Klieger test performed, had good reliability, but you can't rely on a single test that you really need imaging um, is necessary for diagnosis. The other tests had, had fair to poor reliability. Keeping in mind with any athlete with bony tenderness around the ankle, we need to consider the Ottawa ankle rules, which are listed in the position statement, and they carry a level of evidence of category A. 
Plain radiographs should be used not only to rule out a fracture, but also to rule out frank or latent diastasis. Generally, we get at least three views with a lateral and AP and a mortise. And in some cases, we may get weight-bearing views as well. If you've got concerns for the possibility of a masonew fracture or a fibular fracture, you want to make sure you get a complete lower leg x-ray as well so you don't miss that. Radiographic measurements that we're looking for for diastasis or widening of the joint. Um, primarily, there are three, the tibiofibular clear space, tibiofibular overlap are both measured at one centimeter above the plafond, and you look at the medial uh, clear space. Sometimes it's helpful to do um, compare uh, with the unaffected side as well, just to note subtle uh, widening of those uh, measurements. In some cases, stress radiographs may be implicated. However, there's debated value within the literature of doing a stress uh, radiograph. But stress views are oftentimes used to rule out latent diastasis in that with an injury, the ankle may appear uh, as stable, but when you provide some stress to it, the joint will widen. So it's then determined to have latent diastasis versus frank diastasis. These views are generally um, done using the AP or the mortise views, but they're painful for the patient and oftentimes uh, there's inconsistent stress applied by examiners. Therefore, the evidence category for using stress radiographs is a category B. Lamoth did a recent article where they looked at lateral x-rays and stress, um, and, they felt, and they found that the lateral view performed better than the mortise view for determining um, latent diastasis. I'm going to switch gears a little bit and uh, have you think about bone bruising or occult fracture that can occur at the ankle joint. We see this oftentimes with knee injuries, but there's not a lot written in the literature about uh, bone bruising um, of, within the ankle joint because we don't frequently get acute MRIs. However, Brown noted that 24% of the of syndesmotic sprains that he looked at had um, bone bruising, per, particularly of the posterior tubercle. Um, as the fibula is externally rotated, it bangs into this posterior portion of the, of the tibia. Pinner and Chan noted, looking particularly at, at inversion injury, that there was 50% occurrence with anterior talofib and calcaneal fib ligament. Chan noted up to 92% when you had an, a complete tear of the anterior talofib. Here's some bone bruising you can see on MRI, a little bit with a bone scan. And here's the uh, pictures from Chan's article where he talks almost like a contra coup injury on the medial side with an inversion mechanism. So you get bruising in the medial uh, talus and medial tibia all things to consider. Musculoskeletal ultrasound is being used more frequently um, and it's good for point of care use. It can be dynamic in that it can look at the anterior inferior tib fib dynamically. However, uh, I think there's a lot of potential for musculoskeletal ultrasound, but we need to get some more uh, literature. So a hint to some of the younger researchers that may be out there, start looking at ankle injuries with uh, musculoskeletal ultrasound. I think that's a big area that can be developed. There is a, a big learning curve. It is user dependent and you really need to know your anatomy. So given the choice of uh, positive clinical exam and uh, normal x-rays versus positive, positive clinical exam and positive x-rays, it's easy to figure out we need we probably need to do some surgical work with this one and we don't need to do additional testing to say that this ankle's really not too good. But uh, the, the doctor needs to make a decision. Do we need additional imaging? And the imaging uh, uh, modality of choice is an MRI and it's often not done acutely. However, it's being done more frequently with high level athletes and it's good at imaging soft tissue and bone. You can see the individual ligaments as they may appear stretched, wavy, or irregular. You can also see the, the edema and bone bruising, which can occur in the ankle as well. Ryan notes that you may pick up a lambda sign where you get swelling up within the syndesmosis that is in the shape of the Greek letter lambda. One of the problems with MRI is that if the cuts are greater than three millimeters apart, sometimes you're not gonna get good complete imaging of all the ligaments, and it doesn't do a real good job with instability in that it's been noted to only be 50 to 65% sensitive at noting uh, instability of the syndesmosis. 
Kim and Brown have done a real good job of illustrating how an MRI arthrogram uh, increase, can illustrate increased recess height and also proximal dye leakage above that six centimeters can indicate injury to the interosseous ligament, which was one of the primary stabilizers of the syndesmosis. So it can increase sensitivity to greater than 90%. So it may be something to consider, particularly with our higher level athletes. And if, we, if we're gonna do this uh, acutely. Syndesmotic injury is generally graded based off of fracture and non-fracture injury. In the fracture cases that involve syndesmotic injury, we've got the Dennis Weber and the Log Hansen classification systems that are used. And in non-fracture uh, injury, there's a couple purported scales. The West Point receives uh, some, some publicity, but there's no real consensus on grading scales. And, um, you know, I think it's kind of a little arbitrary to say mild, moderate, or intense uh, tenderness, weight bearing, um, whether or not they have frank or latent diastasis. I just don't think we have a real good uh, grading scale for syndesmotic injury. I would like to propose a, a grading scale. And I think that there's, based off of our findings with, uh, with tenderness heights, there, there's a couple of, there's, there may even be a subcategory of high ankle sprain, which I'll call the low high ankle sprain. We have pain above the talocrural joint, tenderness over the anterior inferior tib fib, but the tenderness is less than six centimeters so that the injury does not go above the interosseous ligament. The mechanism is primarily inversion and it's often associated um, with chronic ankle instability and in individuals that have got second degree lateral laxity in that the calcaneofibular ligament is implicated. They generally have a prior history of lateral uh, sprain. So is it progressional in nature? I don't know. They all have functional disability and that they can't hop from their toes, but these ankle sprains have got a shorter disability than the traditional high ankle sprain. And I think they're more common than um, previously appreciated. The uh, Calder found that with anterior fib injury, the syndesmosis may be injured, but it's less likely to be unstable. So I think he kind of supports the low high ankle um, idea or concept. Also in that one um, cadaver view we had earlier where, we, where I showed you how there's increased motion of the talus with increased lat lateral laxity, you can get a synovitis or an irritation in kind of this anterior lateral gutter just inferior to the anterior inferior tib fib, but superior to the anterior tallow fib. And what you'll see, this is a musculoskeletal ultrasound. You see some, some irritation, a wavy ligament over top of it. And this is just an injection that goes in and you can see the medicine coming in and surrounding that tissue. Injection for these, these athletes that have got this anterior lateral gutter or painful anterior uh, tib fib ligament is uh, very effective. So I'd, I'd like to propose a grading scale based off of tenderness length. First degree is that low high ankle sprain. Second degree is six to 10 centimeters of proximal tenderness. That would indicate at least two ligaments uh, of injury. They can't hop. Generally the high ankle sprains are rotational in, uh, in nature. I recommend doing uh, stress uh, x-rays with these ankles. Consider an MRI with gadolinium acutely. Conservative treatment for these may be two to four to six weeks, but there is a high incidence of re-injury and chronic problems. Uh, these athletes just aren't the same uh, if they're injured and try to come back the same season. Third degrees, tenderness is greater than 10 centimeters. I think you should, sus you should suspect latent diastasis. They're associated with posterior medial tenderness of the, of the tibial tubercle. Um, also deltoid injury is associated with this, stress injuries. MRI, and in some cases, if the 3D CT scan is available, you may consider weight-bearing CT, which is receiving some more publicity in the literature these days. There's an interesting paper done by Aspar, where he, um, he polled uh, NFL team physicians and asked them how do they manage NFL or how do they manage non-diastasis um, injuries of the ankle. 28 would use a boot, 14 would be weight-bearing is tolerated, and 12 would be partial weight-bearing. I also wanna draw your attention to another paper that was published by Kadakia, who looked at the amount of motion that's found within, uh, and within a mobilization, within a cast or within a boot. He found as much as 39 degrees of range of motion that can occur to an athlete that's wearing a boot. 
So I think that when we conservatively treat athletes, it's okay. But when we put them into a boot and allow them to weight bear, and knowing that the syndesmosis is stressed throughout the entire range of motion, I think that this is counterproductive and this prolongs recovery. Something to consider. In our article from 2001, we detailed our conservative aggressive approach um, where we use a posterior splint rather than a boot. Uh, we wanna make sure that they're non-weight bearing for four days. Why four days? Because at four days seemed to be where the athlete said, I can start bearing some weight and start doing some more functional activity. You gradually progress uh, rehabilitation, the intensity and duration, and when they can do 10 hops from their toes, they can start running. A little uh, caveat is if they're getting posterior ankle pain, it's an indication that they're doing too much activity. You wanna back off their activity and get that posterior ankle pain under control. Otherwise, that's gonna be something that's gonna limit their return. So in summary, consider the associated injuries with ankle sprains. Don't overlook the syndesmosis. Uh, and tenderness over the syndesmosis. Tenderness length is important, not just for identifying the, the significance or degree of syndesmotic injury, but also for identifying the location of the interosseous ligament. Conservative treatment is an option, but uh, if you choose that route, make sure that we uh, have at least some component of non-weight bearing in the early phase. So as a parting pearl, High ankle sprains don't respect academic degrees or fancy tape jobs. I can tell you that as much as I think I know about syndesmotic sprains, there's times where I just get totally fooled. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Thank you for your attention. Hi, I'm Dr. Justin Fleming from New Brunswick, New Jersey. Uh, and uh, I just want to say what a privilege it is to be able to speak to the Eastern Athletic Trainers Association. Um, I'm really excited about being able to share some thoughts and ideas with you today. And we're gonna discuss um, or continue the discussion of management of syndesmotic injuries um, in, uh, in the athlete. Um, my disclosure today is that I'm a consultant for Arthrex and I don't have any conflicts uh, within this presentation. Um, as was mentioned earlier, I think injury recognition is key to successful treatment uh, of these patients. Um, and I love this quote that the eye only sees what the mind knows, meaning if you're not, um, if it's not on your radar screen, if it's not your differential, the odds are that you're going to miss it. And this injury has historically been underappreciated. Uh, and particularly, we have very poor recognition of this with subtle injury patterns. And we tend to see this basically in the rearview mirror when the real target or the, the, the optimum treatment uh, time has been uh, missed. And so what's the big deal? Well, it's pretty significant, especially in the athletes that you're treating. If you look at this uh, uh, study out of the American Jordan, uh, Journal of Sports Medicine, uh, NCA uh, injury surveillance system for five years, 25% of these players sustained ankle sprains. And if you look at the NFL, the elite athletes in 2016, approximately 15% of players reported a history of a syndesmotic injury. Uh, you know, almost 3,000 days lost to the injury in 2011. Uh, and then basically, as we start to become more aware, you can see in 2012, the numbers uh, continue to uh, get worse. And these are predictive of long-term dysfunction and the overall health uh, of the ankle joint. And so what's the problem? Uh, the problem is much like many of the other soft tissue injuries that we treat, especially in the Liz Frank joint, um, that the spectrum of injury is big and it's not always obvious. Uh, the one on the right, uh, I think this is a doorway diagnosis. Anyone can understand the structures, but it's the patient on the left. This is the one that generally goes under the radar uh, and gets missed and, and really struggles you know, in terms of return to play. And the direct mess mechanism is, is really the most common. This is a fixed foot with a valgus thrust, as you uh, can see here. Um, and this is very, very common, especially uh, in, 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 um, in football. Uh, and so the foot's planted, there's a rotation force, there's a press, but always external rotation is, uh, is present. And when you're talking to your patients, interviewing them on the field or in the training room, really the mechanism will give away this injury in the most part. I asked, does a foot go in or does a foot go out? Uh, and sometimes we're lucky enough to have game film uh, to be able to evaluate. So um, I don't want to um, repeat uh, a lot of what Eric has already really well described, but 
the physical exam, you know, this is not the typical ankle sprain. Patients have the inability to, tear, um, to bear weight. They have tenderness always and potentially swelling of the, the syndesmosis. They can't do a single limb evaluation. Um, and then I would say the most important thing uh, is really the external rotation uh, stress test or the Cotton's test. Really, this is out of the highest specificity for this injury, uh, but unfortunately, it has low sensitivity. Um, and so what about additional imaging studies? I think uh, MRI, we should have a very low threshold of ordering ancillary studies in these uh, patients where we think potentially that all clinical roads um, in, in, in symptoms uh, lead down to the syndesmosis. Um, and the issue with MRI is really, you know, should we be managing these patients surgically uh, without a diastasis? And the problem with any static study is that we're really taking a snapshot or a picture of a dynamic structure. Um, but what we are looking for definitely is a two ligament injury threshold, um, because that typically is the point at which um, the, the ankle joint becomes, or the syndesmosis becomes unstable, and they generally require um, surgical intervention. And oftentimes you'll see these kind of peel back lesions of the posterior inferior tip fib ligament. Those are avulsive type uh, injuries that may or may not involve some cortical involvement. And then we really understand the importance of the deltoid. This is the absolute most critical ligament uh, in the ankle joint. And oftentimes, especially in these rotary injuries, the deltoid becomes disrupted. Uh, and when the deltoid becomes disrupted, the talus becomes very, very unstable. And typically these are seen with the majority of syndesmotic uh, injuries. So uh, stress radiographs are, are basically the next step. Uh, patients tolerate this very well, unlike Liz Frank injuries where we're doing stress abduction, patients don't tolerate that very well. But you know the key is to keep the ankle in neutral flexion. As you know, the talus is smaller on the back than it is in the front. So if the ankle's in plantar flexion, you can get an artificially positive test because the there will be an increase in the medial clear space. But again, this is taking a static picture and looking at it in a dynamic fashion. So on the left, Obviously, the non stress side in the right, you see the widening of the medial clear space um, and lateral translation of the talus, indicating that both the syndesmosis and the deltoid ligaments are in fact uh, disrupted. So, we know that the external rotation stress test is the most sensitive clinical test to determine instability, but oftentimes the problem is that it's just not sensitive enough to identify subtle instability patterns and particularly rotational instability patterns, which we can't see on an AP or a lateral uh, X-ray. And so well, what's the answer to this? Um, and this is a really great study done in 2015 by uh, uh, foot and ankle surgeons out in Ohio. And basically did serial sectioning of the, of the syndesmotic ligaments and determined uh, what becomes uh, unstable in an arthroscopic environment. So there's basically four categories, no, no ligaments disruption, uh, AITFL and interosseous ligament, and then AITFL and CFL, and then all four ligaments are ruptured. And basically when we had a two ligament injury, particularly the AITFL and the interosseous ligament, um, this is when the uh, syndesmosis become, became unstable. Um, and so this has really kind of been the benchmark uh, two ligament disruption. Um, and here's another study, uh, 2017 Foot and Ankle International, just really kind of, again, defining what subtle instability is, because this is really our problem patient where we just don't know what the best answer is. And so um, in this study, uh, we're now down to, to millimeters. And so when we're doing arthroscopic examinations uh, for patients, uh, we, if, if, there's a three millimeter uh, space or we can get a three millimeter shaver or sphere uh, up inside the incisional notch. We know that there's at least two ligament injury and this is 100% predictive, uh, at least in the cadaveric uh, model. So these are the benchmarks that we've that we kind of uh, have laid out in terms of determining stability patterns and, and best uh, treatment mechanisms. So, the algorithm for the subtle injury is basically an MRI. If we can confirm that there's a two ligament injury, we're certainly thinking about exam under anesthesia and stress fluoroscopy. If we have an equivocal exam, meaning the MRI shows that there's two ligaments uh, and the stress fluoroscopy is negative, then potentially we need to do an arthroscopic evaluation. Um, and um, 
uh, synosmosis stabilization operative intervention is, is indicated if we have a positive stress exam or an arthroscopically identified level of uh, instability. And each of you are aware, uh, most likely, of uh, you know, this story of Tua Tekosilova. Um, and so this was really what brought synosmosis kind of out into the open for everyone to see. Um, and it still hurts a little bit to see this injury, um, but really this is shows the success and the treatment that we have uh, for this. And this is introducing the tightrope device. Tightrope surgery leading to a quicker recovery. Recovery. And this demonstrated the power of the tightrope and our ability to get patients back very quickly. In less than 30 minutes, putting players like Tugavailoa back on the field in no time. And this was just a really great highlight for for the medical community. And then back in a month. First question they all ask is, Doc, when can I get back? Tightrope has been a um, big addition to my practice in our armamentarium to allow us to, to get guys back quicker. One of the biggest advances in foot and ankle surgery. And we can get them back super fast. Continue to get treatment on that ankle, which was operated on about five weeks ago. There's not like his extra bandage or, or wrapping on it. He looks great. I'm just amazed by this procedure. I, I think it's going to be a game changer, not just for Alabama and Tua, but I think the industry. And so you can appreciate with this level of um, uh, with this level of uh, kind of advertisement or promotion uh, or excitement about this, you know, we get patients a lot that will come in and, uh, and coaches that will ask for this device. And so we just want to make sure that we're using it responsibly. And so the question is, why should we use a tightrope for a million years with these screws? And basically, there's a lot of science and I, I won't go through all of it. But essentially, this allows for normal physiologic motion uh, of the, uh, the fibula, which improves collagen healing, which is the basis for, for uh, synosmotic stabilization. We take them out less. It's two times stronger in cyclical load than, than large uh, screws. But really, the most important thing is that we get a more accurate reduction of synosmosis, and we get a reduction in latent diastasis of the ankle joint, which simply means that it keeps the ankle joint together um, and that's critical, number one, to play. But overall, if we get separation of the ankle joint, these patients go on to arthritic changes, and we just don't have a great solution for arthritis in a young uh, patient. And so here's just a lot of level one evidence uh, looking at synosmotic screws versus tightrope. This has been a really hot topic uh, for at least the last uh, five years. Uh, and I think at this point, we've proven that this is simply a better device uh, for for uh, patients. Um, there's lots of cl clinical evidence. Um, this was um, 46 uh, patients with no difference in uh, outcome scores. But when you look at synosmotic reduction on post-operative CAT scans, we had 0% now reduced in the tightrope group and 21% in the synosmotic screw group. So, you know, we think that we're doing a better job getting these uh, to, uh, together. 70 patients, five trauma centers, tightrope versus screws. Um, and essentially we had more um, uh, hardware removal in screw patients, but more importantly, there's a loss of correction in four of the screw patients. And three of these came after the screw was removed. And this simply tells us that the scar tissue may not be significant enough, especially if you're taking out these screws uh, early. And um, another study just kind of highlighting that we have less mortise widening two years after, which ultimately is the goal is to give these patients um, back to play, but to do it safely and also look at the long-term health uh, of, uh, of the ankle. So here's a case example, 16 year old uh, middle linebacker, 235 pounds, comes in with an ankle sprain, unable to weight bear, describes an external rotation injury, positive mid cast and positive uh, of cotton's test. And here's the external rotation stress test done in the office. Uh, these patients tolerate this uh, very well. And you can see uh, the medial clear space widening, the lateral Taylor translation. Uh, and this is really a, a positive uh, test. And here's the arthroscopic uh, examination. And so what you see here is just kind of taking a probe and pushing the fibula posteriorly. So not only uh, do patients often get, um, you know, a medial to lateral separation, they can also have a sagittal plane or a coronal complaint uh, component um, where the, the posterior and the anterior syndesmosis are, uh, are, are disrupted. And this is not something that you can see on a plain film uh, radiograph. And, and this is what that looks like, just kind of using a two, um, two hole, small plate, small incision, 
uh, after an arthroscopic uh, examination. This is a subacute presentation, which unfortunately I see a lot because again, these injuries tend to come uh, tend to go uh, under the radar. Uh, but basically, this is a 19-year-old Division I uh, offensive lineman, 290 pounds, diagnosed with a high ankle sprain, 10 weeks post-op. Um, he has um, uh, described an external rotation injury. I was able, able to see his films, unable to play. Uh, and, and these patients will often come in describing that they just can't uh, push off. They have, no, they have complete loss of uh, explosive power. And this is what his um, MRI looks at. And he clearly has a two ligament injury plus the deltoid, even though his x-rays look relatively um, uh, normal. And so what we did for him was an arthroscopic uh, debridement of the ankle. Uh, oftentimes these patients will have osteochondral lesions or chondral lesions. Again, the ankle does not do well with rotation and shear uh, forces under compression. And so here you can see two tight ropes uh, housed in a, a, a lateral plate. We like to call this a push plate. It basically distributes forces along the course of the lateral malleolus so that we don't have periosteal rub and um, bone irritation uh, because we want these devices to, uh, to stay in. But on the left-hand side, you can see that uh, when the patient's asleep, you can see his exam becomes positive. You have a uh, translation of the medial of the talus or the medial clear space. Um, and the injury becomes a little bit more um, identifiable. Um, and then this is what the arthroscopic exam looks like. Um, this is uh, what we do routinely for most athletes. This is the initial kind of putting the arthroscope in. And what you can see is basically all this fibrous tissue. This is the anterior inferior tibial ligament, which is ruptured. We're along the anterior portion of the fibula now. And you can see I have a three, five shaper. I can easily introduce it into the incisor or notch. You can see a little bit of cartilage damage there. Um, and now we're looking down the lateral gutter. You're looking straight at the fibula. The tibia is up top. And all of the, the tissue that you see on the right is all uh, torn inferior um, tib fib um, um, ligament. And so um, here's a 17 year old soccer player, persistent ankle sprain after a rotational injury. Um, and you can see uh, really this anterior posterior translation on the fibula arthroscopically. And so I'm essentially pushing the fibula out posteriorly out of the uh, incisor notch. Uh, and you can see there's a little bit of medial clear space widening to see those subtle injuries. And then after the tight rope, you can see that the, the ankle joint space is uh, in fact uh, equidistant. Um, here is just demonstrating some of the rotary instability that we see at the time of surgery. This is a complete disruption of the syndesmosis. I externally rotate. Uh, you can see the torn AITFL. You can look right down into the ankle joint. Um, and this is where we apply the tightrope fixation. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this. Um, but basically, the, the technique is relatively straightforward. Um, they're showing the technique in someone who's had um, uh, a lateral malleolar fracture. Um, but basically, we drill through uh, all the cortices of, um, uh, of the ankle joint. We create a path. Um, and then the tightrope is inserted. Um, and this is called the tightrope XP. It's basically the newest, latest, and greatest. Um, but we used to have to make an incision on the medial side of the ankle. And now we can essentially flip the button um, by using the handheld um, uh, piece here. And as we move this uh, black button back, uh, the button uh, on the medial side flips. Um, and then we can go ahead and, and, and tighten the, uh, the device down. And as we tighten it down, it essentially brings the, uh, the fibula, it seats the fibula back into um, the incisional notch. Um, and then we can repeat the stress exam to make sure that we have it at physiologic uh, tension. And so this is essentially how this device works. Um, sometimes um, you will see that um, even after we put in a tightrope, there's still a small amount of rotational instability. And so in these situations, what we actually do is we reconstruct the anterior inferior tib fib ligament uh, with a device called the internal brace. And you may have heard Drew Brees, who had a, um, a ligament injury in his thumb, uh, and he was able to get back to, um, to, to throwing in three weeks. We're using the same technology to individually fix ligaments in the ankle. And so uh, final x-rays on the left, and I'm just repeating the stress exam, looking for any residual instability. Uh, and um, you can see that the ankle mortis is uh, stable. And then the second thing that you have to look at once you get the 
uh, lateral side fix is you have to go inside and look at the deltoid. Um, and oftentimes these are waltz like a sleeve off of, um, uh, off of the anterior clitoris and the interclicular groove. Um, and here you can see uh, the cartilage fibrillations, and this is a positive drive through sign. I can take an arthroscope and drive it right down. And you can see there's a complete rupture of the deltoid ligament. Uh, and it's so significant, and the, 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 the capsule is torn in the, in the um, uh, you can actually see the flexor tendon. So this is a very massive uh, deltoid injury. And again, you can see some of the chondral injury that exists. So this is a paper by Bob Anderson. Um, you know, he obviously has really led the way for a lot of us in terms of treating um, athletes. Um, in uh, essentially in his um, uh, treatment of uh, elite athletes, he almost always repairs the um, deltoid ligament it's simply because this cuff of tissue that you see essentially invaginates inside. And a lot of these patients will have no lateral pain, but they may have medial ankle pain, which means either they have an impingement syndrome or they have residual medial ankle instability where there's deltoid um, insufficiency that certainly can be repaired. So in summary, I think this is um, a really clinically relevant uh, topic for all of us. And at, you know, determining subtle instability at the syndesmosis, it remains a really uh, challenging and difficult, but I think we're making big headway in terms of uh, the threshold for, for surgery and our ability to diagnose these. Um, again, arthroscopy is a really critical tool for all of us in terms of detecting uh, subtle injuries in that three millimeter clear space is, is important. Um, and again, syndesmotic instability doesn't come in one flavor. It comes in multiple flavors. And depending on the level of injury um, and the energy of the injury imparted to the pe person, um, it may be uh, instability in multiple planes. And I think at this point, our best treatment option really is the tightrope. Uh, and we have a lot of uh, good level one evidence at this point um, to, uh, uh, to give us confidence and impart that confidence into, into trainers, into parents, uh, and into players that we can get them back uh, safely and, and quickly. So uh, I'm grateful for your time. Uh, thank you so much for letting me uh, share this today. Patrick McKeon from Ithaca College, your moderator, here with Eric Nussbaum to answer the questions that were posted in the session. So Eric, work, working through in terms of, of what we have with regards to the, the questions, the first question that received the most votes, the NATA position statement recommends NSAIDs as a level A recommendation. However, there has been favorable evidence allowing for our natural inflammatory process to occur for healing. Do you have any newer thoughts on, on this? Um, well, <coughs> the, the anti-inflammatory debate has kind of been going on, you know, in the, in the recent uh, years, there's both pro and con uh, literature for it. I don't know that I can, I can uh, easily comment on, um, whether or not it, it's something that we should be doing or not be doing. Uh, all I can say is my personal experience when I take an, some Advil for, you know, for, for achiness, it, it helps my pain, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know whether it's the, the mental component of taking, uh, you know, some sort of medication uh, or not. I'm not a person that relies on heavy, on heavy medication to get through something. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that I can uh, favorably comment on that. All right. Well, moving on to the next one, based on your presentation that you gave us, when do you recommend assessing the hop test for acute ankle sprains? So oh. how does performance then on the hop test also relate to stress test findings, such as from the squeeze test and the Cli Cligers so, test? So I'll do, a kid gets injured out on the field. I get him off to the sideline. Like I said, it's a progressional evaluation. So I'll just say, you know, can we do double toe raises? If they can do double toe raises, can you do a double, you know, can you do a single toe raise? Can you do a double leg hop? Can you do a single leg hop? Um, that is a, a progressional evaluation, but if they can't hop from their toes, um, 
I know that there's some sort of uh, syndesmotic involvement because they'll, they're going to have tenderness over their distal anterior tib fib. And whether or not they have more proximal tenderness um, is probably my suspicion is definitely heightened by that. So mm -hmm. I'll use it right on the on the field. I'll use it in the athletic training room. I think it's a it's a fair test that they can do. Mm -hmm. I didn't mention this study, but we presented a, a poster at the International Ankle Congress uh, several years ago in Kentucky, where we looked at 365 high school athletes who had ankle sprains. And we found that all kids that had lateral injury, no matter if it was first to third degree, were able to do a single leg hop from their toes um, versus those that had any syndesmotic involvement were not able to do a hop. So um, to me, it's a, it's, a, it's a very indicative test and uh, yeah. I think it's got high value. Uh, I think that that makes complete sense. Just, as, well, just to as qualify a that, I mean, if you're if you're looking at them and you have suspicion that they have a fracture because they've got bony tenderness, then maybe you're waiting, you know, till you get the X-ray to do that. But if mm -hmm. if it's just uh, joint tenderness, put them through the hop test and see what they mm -hmm. can do. That makes sense. And even cu coupling that with with the uh, with the evidence about the reluctance to want to be doing a drop le landing or a hop test. Is indicative of, of 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 worse outcomes down down the line just for ankle sprains in itself. That's greater. And then, so can can you please expand on the dis the advantages and the disadvantages of using a boot versus a posterior splint for the management of a high ankle sprain? Well, one I like using a posterior splint because uh, each day that the athlete that returns to the athletic training room, I'm able to get a good evaluation if they're bearing weight. Mm -hmm. So I think that non-weight bearing, particularly for the first four days, is very important. Um, and if I have a, if I use a posterior splint and the kid comes in and the ACE wrap is all beat up, the bottom of the splint is is dirty. I know mm -hmm. the kid's walking around on it, so I can have a conversation with them about the importance of uh, of not bearing weight. Mm -hmm. Whereas if they're in a boot, you know they're walking on it. You know, mm -hmm. so um, I just have got str a strong feeling that. Uh, they really need a component, a boot is fine, but they really need that component of non-weight bearing, particularly in the first four days, uh, to, to really get some, some tissue uh, healing that can, that can get started. So um, I'm a big fan of non-weight bearing early on. And uh, you know, with, the, with uh, the one study that showed the increased motion, no matter what the, the immobilization is, uh, that's some, that's a factor that you're going to be continually stressing your syndesmosis while you're trying to get it to heal with weight bearing. Mm -hmm. Well, I think with, with that, that's a great point in terms of, of easing off on the weight bearing early on. So now for the next one, for the diagnostic purposes and reassessment, what are your thoughts on squatting? And then also are about the, the ability, the depth, um, any predictive cap capabilities for diagnosing the grade of injury associated with, with squat or how we can use that in terms of progressing improvement? Well, as you get down um, deeper into your squat, you're going to be putting more stress on your, on your anterior syndesmosis. So mm -hmm. um, I definitely think it's going to be a factor if they've got a, if they've got a tender sore ligament, they're not going to be able to squat that deep. Mm -hmm. um, if you're thinking in terms of, can I still do squatting activity while they have an ankle injury? Um, uh, not quite sure if, uh, we should be doing that while they still have a tender ligament, but mm -hmm. could you use that as a functional examination? You probably could. Do you, probably do, could. I don't do know that it determines that it's going to help you determine a more significant injury. Mm -hmm. I think I can do that pretty well with my clinical, ex clinical assessment mm -hmm. and by using imaging, you know, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. And then from that st st standpoint, what you were talking about before, given the mechanism of injury, is it the case that the, the more the deltoid damage is involved, the more the syndesmosis is damaged? And then, in other words, is it, the deltoid is the first line of defense for the external rotation dorsiflexion valgus force, and then damage to, it allows damage to the distal um, tib, fib joint? Uh, what are your thoughts about that? My thinking has always been that it's been more the syndesmotic ligaments. I mean, if you look at the deltoid anatomically, it's a big, thick ligament. You know, so it's not, it's, it's not, it's a lot bigger and stronger than your, than your lateral ligaments are. And um, could you, you know, the, the thinking more recently is that 
there's associated delta subtle associated deltoid inju- uh, ligament injury with some of these high ankle sprains. And um, I I get that. I appreciate that. Uh, the deltoid pain hasn't been, at least in the high ankle sprains that I've worked with, the major limiting factor for you know the athletes that I've that I've worked with. But could the anterior portion of the superficial deltoid be the first ligament that goes? Maybe, but you still don't you don't get medial laxity in that you know in that initial process. When you get a syndesmotic sprain with greater than ten centimeters of of proximal tenderness, uh, you most likely have got deltoid tenderness that goes along with it. So mm-hmm. I think they work synergistically t- uh, together. Mm-hmm. Well, going going along with that, on the opposite side, there was a brief mention of increased subtalar lac- laxity with the sprain of the calcaneofibular ligament. Yep. Can you speak to the prevalence and implications of the talocalcaneal interosseous and cervical ligaments in patients with a lateral ankle sprain or now even patients with a low high ankle sprain? Yeah, no, I, I, you definitely will see it. If you, if you look to palpate it in your clinical exam, you're going to find those patients that have got that, that tenderness there. So mm-hmm. uh, that's definitely a valid consideration. I'm not sure how much, because taping and bracing is so good that it's, it's very effective, how much that, that tenderness becomes a limiting factor because we can, the bracing is, is really good that it helps to minimize the, the medial and lateral tilt um, you know, post injury, that we can minimize that 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 injury from the you know to the subtalar joint. But yeah, you'll definitely see patients that'll that'll have tenderness right over that that uh, that spot over the over the ligaments. No, and I, and I and I think that that's what what you talked about before, especially with with your concept of the low high ankle sprain, especially. You know, we traditionally learn that a high ankle sprain, the mechanism is dorsiflexion, external rotation, yep. pronation, th- those types of things. But the idea of raising awareness that it is also associated with the classic mechanism for a lateral ankle sprain is really important. So I thought right. that, and that's, that, that's why I tried to show the, uh, the schematic. You know, as you get increased lateral laxity, you've got increased motion of your, of your talus within the mm-hmm. joint. And with an axial load, that that lateral shoulder, the talus, can act as a fulcrum against the fibula. To, to I'm not saying that you're going to disrupt the anterior inferior tip fib ligament, but it definitely becomes tender, and it becomes uh, it becomes problematic. And then they can't then they can't hop. Mm-hmm. You know, so there there is that component. It's probably a five to seven to ten day injury. You know, if you if you treat it the right way, they definitely get better quicker. If it's under six centimeters. But it is definitely implicated in in acute disability. I think well, you don't see I, it with just you don't see it with just a straight anterior talo fib. But when you have tenderness over the calcaneal fib too, you oftentimes will have uh, anterior inferior tib fib ligament. That's um, a that's so. a great call. You know, in in terms of looking at a key feature in terms of suspicion, that's that, that's good because it makes a lot of sense. Then combining that with the hop test, that if they can't perform a hop, mm-hmm. then we're thinking down the line towards the issue of, of the high of the high ankle sprain involvement. And I think taking it a little bit further too, when you talk about the potential for um, Taylor bruising, um, for bone mm-hmm. bruise, for osteochondral lesion, particularly on the lateral shoulder of the of the talus as it's banging into the lateral fibula, you know, that may you know be a factor um, as well. And again, you'll find these kids, particularly with that chronically sore anterior inferior tib fib ligament, that they've got that little bit of synovitis in the anterior lateral gutter. Um, I've seen injections work for that very well. You inject it and you pull them off for four or five days and they're like a new person because uh, mm-hmm. you know you allow the medication to work. Not inject them and get them back out to play. Um, it's mm-hmm. inject them and sit them and, and uh, you know give it several days to recover. Uh, I think that's got a valuable uh, impact or a valuable effect. Oh, that's, that's great. Now, we have a question. Um, I had a patient once with a fifth metatarsal fracture that presented with a high with high ankle pain, a positive squeeze test, and the inability to bear weight. Would you agree that getting routine X-rays for high ankle sprains is a good policy? Better safe than sorry. I think yeah. Well, it's I think with any ankle sprain, and whether it's uh, again, I didn't get into the foot that much either. But you know, even with uh, 
our classic uh, lateral ankle evaluation, you're always, I was taught to palpate the, the fifth metatarsal, you know, as, as well. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that uh, we should be getting some x-rays on these ankles and, uh, you know, hopefully you can, uh, that may be picked up, you know, with imaging, but through clinical evaluation, through palpation and tenderness, it should definitely uh, heighten your awareness or, or heighten your sensitivity to, to there being um, syndesmotic injury. So I really think like if you, if you really heighten your palpation skills and know your anatomy, it's going to lead you down the path and you take a good history with the, with the patient. They, they're, they have functional disability. They can't do a single leg hop test. They have the tenderness on the distal tib fib. Um, you know, it, it really paints a, a clearer picture for you as, as you're able to do. Um, I, I totally agree with that. Yeah. And, and, and that having that, con that conceptual map in there in your head as you're going through your palpation points about what the underlying pieces that you're putting together are. And I thought that that was a really good point that you brought up about the ring of stability, as opposed to just thinking, well, the AITF and the PITF are there. It, it really, when you put in the transverse and the interosseous membranes, you get that, that, that ring, which leads to that rotary aspect. Yep. Um, and, and so the deltoid excellent. too. So like mm -hmm. even looking with high ankle sprains, it's important to palpate the posterior medial corner of the tibia. Um, you know, if they've got bony tenderness, that's right, you know, tenderness right on the bone, their return is going to be limited by their bony tenderness, by that bone mm -hmm. stress injury, probably more so than, than the ligament, you know, sometimes. So mm -hmm. I've seen kids that have got bony tenderness, that posterior medial tubercle, that they don't get better until that bony tenderness gets better. When the bony tenderness gets better, then their their ankle issue, you know, gets better. But you know, they may also be ones that have got that subtle uh, instability that, uh, you know, like with Tua, like Dr. Fleming, you know, was talking about. It's the it's the ones that may have it's that second degree high ankle sprain that have got greater than six centimeters of, of proximal tenderness. They don't have frank diastasis, but they can't hop. But you know that they've got that subtle, probably have got that subtle instability. If you did an MRI arthrogram, you'd see dye leak up uh, the interosseous membrane. Well, maybe the right thing to do is to pop a tightrope on them. I mean, Tool was back in two weeks. You know, if conservatively, I know I can treat that ankle and get them back in, in two to three weeks, why wouldn't I get primary stability by popping in a, uh, a tightrope? And I know that I've got stabilization, use an accelerated rehab program and get them back. And that's, that's a lot of what University of Alabama has been doing with their, their management of high ankle sprains. Now, the question or the, or the problem arises is if you have to fix the, the, the deltoid ligament, that's going to slow your, your recovery. So how many Alabama hasn't published their results on, on, you know, all these guys that they're doing acutely, how many do they have to go back and fix the deltoid or mm -hmm. how many of them have failed or have residual? You're not going to see the tightrope fail because mm -hmm. I think there's only been one case of the tightrope actually rupturing mid-substance. And I think that was Jeremy Shockey uh, was one of the ones that, that did that. But um, it's, it's a very strong uh, repair process. So it's, a, it's an interesting concept and something to think about. No, I totally agree. And now we're we're actually coming to the end of the question and answer session. Eric, thank you very much for, for sharing your time, your expertise. We really greatly appreciate it. And on behalf of the EATA, thank you very, very much for your hard work for and and also for Justin as well, all, all the work that you put into your presentation and for shaping the body of evidence that we have. Thank, thank you, you very everyone. much. Thank you very much. If if uh, viewers have got additional questions, please feel free to email me, ericn at uognj.com. Happy to answer them. Thank you.